Not everyone was singing the blues in October of 1923. For many, the future was looking downright peachy. Britain's Ministry of Transport had urged local councils to do away with the unsightly billboards that were disfiguring the countryside. In California, siblings Walter and Roy founded the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio. Babe Ruth set a Yankees record, hitting a career-high 393, while in Evanston, Illinois, John Charles Carter was born to parents Russell and Lila Charlton Carter. Three decades later, the world would know the young man as Charlton Heston. Now, despite all that, George Trevor was unboyed. For his feature piece in the AKC Gazette of January 1924, the lament flowed onto the keys of his Underwood number no. five. No matter what breed is under discussion, it's champions. Champions of other more popular breeds he sulked laud qualities such as loyalty, gentleness, trainability, and perceptiveness, while oblivious to the virtues of the poodle, which can see their hand and raise them one. Please do not laugh, therefore, when we tell you that the poodle possesses all these qualities and one that he shares with no other breed. He is a born comedian. In prose of radiant purple, Trevor sneered at a fickle public whose canine breed fashions turned with the breeze. In 1923, he reported they blew in the direction of the German shepherd dog. Society, that weather vein of sentiment whereby fanciers gauge the trend of the market, has left no doubts of its fondness for the shepherds. They are the rage, the fad of the hour. Tomorrow, mayhap, the Vogue will switch to Siberian vodka hounds. The German Shepherd's popularity tapped a deep vein of jealousy in the lonely poodle advocate. German Shepherds this, German Shepherds that. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha! Exactly. Spoiler, Trevor was right. Though its popularity endures, the German Shepherd would lose its it-dog status by the 1930s, with the rise of fascism in Europe, America had soured on the Krauts, and Trevor was wrong-ish. Though in a few short years, the poodle would narrowly escape extinction. What's more, it would achieve critical mass and soar to a popularity that would have fanciers of other breeds muttering, well... Marsha, Marsha, Marsha! And still, for all its fame, the poodle remains underestimated, underrated, and misunderstood. Let's fix that. I'm Bud Bacone. Let me introduce you to the poodle you might not know. For behind those quaffed curls lies, centuries in the making, a hunter, guide, clown, fashion plate, rescue hero, even a crime fighter. There have been dogs as long as there have been people. No keys. This dog was going places. Fast. The American Kennel Club. Kennel Club. Kennel Club. Take your dog down and back for me, please. Down and Back. Stories from the AKC Archives. This is the show for you. With Bud Bacone. This puppy has potential. The Standard Poodle. Written off by many as a prissified, ploofy, oversized lapdog. A breed we can... <laughs> That's me from season one. <laughs> Get a load of my clothes and the hair. <laughs> in that episode, we explained that the story of obedience training in America can't be told without meeting the eminently trainable Standard Poodle. To recap... The Poodle is a source of some great barbed answers. There is no such breed as a French Poodle. The Poodle is probably of German origin. Its name is derived from a low German word meaning splash in the water. Moreover, it was bred as a retriever, fetching ducks for their handlers. As for the Poodle cut, for all its air of haute couture, it's all about function. Adorned with hair, not fur, the Poodle Cut was developed to optimize the breed for hunting. Its hair is kept longer around joints and vital organs to insulate it in cold water. Elsewhere, the cut is short, 
helping prevent snagging in underwater roots and plants. Like many dogs with jobs, there's not a lot of documentation about their earlier days because their owners were busy, you know, working. We do know that five centuries ago, poodles were found mostly in France, Russia, and Germany. They can be found today in works such as this, by renowned German painter and engraver Albrecht Dürer, a contemporary of Martin Luther. Dorer's works survive in galleries all around the world, many including or sometimes featuring dogs, and many of those breeds are recognizable to fanciers as direct ancestor of today's standard poodle. Earlier still, there's evidence of poodles in the 1400s, in this work by Italian master Pinturicchio. And that's likely a poodle in this work from 16th century Flemish artist Martin de Vos. And in this 18th century painting by Spanish master Francesco Goya. Together they paint a familiar dynamic covering five centuries. Poodles, beloved both as a retriever and in homes, as a treasured member of the family. Everyone's happy and we all get home before the streetlights come on. But in the 19th century, with much of Europe at war, people, traditions, and pets cross-pollinated among countries. And that's how the poodle caught les yeux of the French. And before you could say Jacques Robinson, the French did what they're famous for. They fell in love. Granted, the poodle functioned en français as a retriever. There it's called the caniche, or duck dog. It also became a cultural icon and the national dog of France. Poodles became a favorite in the court of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Boo! Up, 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 up. En français? Le Boo. Yet mercifully, they escaped the gaze of Madame Defarge and friends. Perhaps it was the poodle's other role as a caniche and as an everyone's dog that preserved its status with the poorer citizens of France. Some had taken to employing the poodle as a truffle hunter. Uh, footnote here, there is some controversy. Uh, some insist that the truffle hunting poodle is a variation of the breed. We'll let them duke it out for themselves. It is known that some truffle hunting poodles would work in tandem. The poodle sniffs out the goods, while the digging dog, perhaps a, a dachshund or a terrier, oversees the acquisition. And if by the revolution, the French hadn't become fully enamored of the poodle, its heroics in the Napoleonic Wars sealed the deal. Legends abound, including that of Moustache. Born in 1799, he was soon adopted as mascot to a regiment of French grenadiers. One story has Moustache, or Moose, if you're on a first-syllable basis, alerting his regiment to a night attack from the Austrians. For that, it's said he was granted a grenadier's per diem and decorated with a collar. He marched with the army through the Alps and was present at the Battle of Marengo, where he lost an ear. Yet the grand mare of moose stories, best told on a winter's night over a steaming mug of cocoa, tells of his exploits in the Battle of Austerlitz. There, the regiment's ensign, assigned to carry the colors, was isolated and surrounded by the enemy. As all appeared lost, Moustache rushed to his aid. The wounded ensign had wrapped the colors around his body to ward off the inevitable disgrace of losing them. At that moment, a charge of grape shot felled the attackers, too late to save the ensign. Working carefully, Moustache is said to have worked the colors free from around the ensign's body and return it safely to the care of his regiment. Moustache, it's said, later joined a regiment of dragoons in Spain, and in 1811 was killed in the Battle of Badajoz. There, the steadfast black poodle was awarded a hero's burial. Other poodles would be commemorated for their war service, names such as Morfino, Thautou, Sancho, Mazunta, and Babouche live on in French folklore. By the time of Napoleon's second and final exile on the island of St. Helena, hard to keep a good emperor down, he would sometimes reminisce. 
There, he dictated a story about the Battle of Marengo, where, following the day's fighting, he toured the battleground. There, he recalls coming upon the remains of two friends killed that day, one of them a grenadier, and with him the soldier's faithful poodle, whose last conscious act was to lick his master's face. The emperor said it was a beautiful, clear moonlight in the profoundest solitude of the night. Never had anything on any of my battlefields caused me a like emotion. Warrior, retriever, beloved companion, the poodle earned its place in the hearts of millions. And what German breeders begat and the French adopted, let no one put asunder. Who wouldn't embrace such a fine breed? The British. That's who. You're listening to Down and Back, stories from the AKC archives. Despite the popularity of hunting through the Victorian era, the Brits never warmed up to the poodle as a gun dog for a number of reasons, some of them good. One was the surfeit of outstanding homemade breeds. Retrievers, spaniels, pointers, setters, it was a buyer's market, no continental dogs need apply. Another was the growing scarcity of water-based quarry. Hunting was gravitating away from lakes and ponds and onto the four-legged game of terra firma. And with it, demand shifted towards land-based hunting dogs. Another reason was reputation. The poodle wasn't seen as a well-bred hunting companion so much as a prissy, fluffy, ribbons and bows, smoogie-woogie, sissified indoor companion to nobility, folks who'd rather nibble petty fours with tea than sully their finery in the deep grass of England's countryside. Worse yet, in the minds of the Brits, the poodle was French. And that just wouldn't do. Yet despite the best interests of Mr. and Mrs. John Bull, poodles somehow found their way across the channel. In 1875, the poodle made its first appearance in England's Kennel Club stud book. That's the thin edge of the wedge for you. Less than a decade later, the Poodle Club of England was formed. A year later, a quartered poodle won best in show at the Kennel Club show in London. Excuse me. Uh, got a text. Uh, hey, bud, what's a corded poodle? Good question. Left to grow, a standard poodle's coat, which is well adapted to water, will tend to cord. Some owners patiently aid the process. At about seven to nine months of age, a poodle's adult coat will start to come in. As it does, the shed coat becomes fused with the new hair, forming little bundles. Managing this becomes a matter of keeping these bundles or cords separate. Yeah, uh, essentially canine dreadlocks. The aesthetics come at a cost. The coat must be kept scrupulously clean. They can collect twigs, grass, and debris, and can be prone to mildew. And they've been known to grow to 20 inches. For many a fastidious poodle fancier, the labor is totally worth it, though they probably don't take their dog on a lot of camping trips. Uh, where were we? By the time poodles appeared on the radar of Britain's Kennel Club, they were companion animals for the well-to-do. These uh, superb hunting companions were assigned to the non-sporting group. Meanwhile, across the pond... The American Kennel Club, still wet behind the ears, had formed in Philadelphia and in 1887 opened its New York headquarters on Broadway, albeit in a 15 by 20 foot room. Plans for an indoor agility course would have to wait. That year, AKC registered its first poodle, named Czar. It had been imported by owner W. Lyman Biddle of Philadelphia. That year, at the 11th annual Westminster Dog Show, poodles made a distinct impression, certainly on the crowd, and definitely on a mischievous, uncredited reporter for the New York Times. 
A black poodle is an animated ink spot in perpetual motion. An ordinary dog that has been dipped in a dye tub and run through the rag machine of a paper mill. Styx, belonging to W. Cochran Sanford, took the first prize, and Brigand, also Mr. Sanford's, whose hind legs, Brigand's, not Sanford's, are trimmed like black mutton chops at a French diner, took the second. In a refrain familiar to dog show goers everywhere, he added, There was the usual amount of dissatisfaction among owners, though the judges were as fair as possible. Though a thing in America, poodles weren't an American thing. Dogs tended to be imports, a European dog making the occasional appearance in the USA. A society dog? A companion? Sure. But in America, as in Britain, few poodles were pressed into service as gun dogs. Poodles were given a home in the American Kennel Club's non-sporting group. See also under T for this dog don't hunt. Decades passed with the poodle never quite finding traction among American dog fanciers. Hence the lament of George Trevor, who in 1923 wrote his ode to the declining poodle. By then, American poodle propagation fell to just a few devoted breeders. Few were registered with AKC, and it became unusual to see so much as one entered at a dog show. Though poodles could be found in America's homes, it wasn't unusual for kennels to give away more pups than they sold. There was one place Americans could find the poodle front and center. In vaudeville halls and circuses. As George Trevor had complained, few appreciated the poodle's gift as a born comedian, by no means a newly acquired gift. Remember the artwork we looked at earlier? This is The Dancing Dog by Jan Steen, a 17th century Dutch painter. That's very likely a poodle dancing on its hind legs amid a crowd of musicians and roisterers who are the near cousin to the merrymaker. By no means the only early depiction of poodles as crowd pleasers. That for the poodle is its blessing and its curse just as her exotic look caught the eye of royalty and high society, her intelligence and trainability made her the quintessential showbiz dog. Once I built a railroad, I made it run. Alas, by 1930, high society had moved on. The circus and vaudeville were on the wane. Maybe George Trevor, the Debbie Downer of poodledom, had a point. Can you spare a dime? It seemed as though securing the poodle's future in America might take a miracle, or at least a force of nature. And this force of nature had a name. She was Charlotte Hayes Blake Hoyt, society woman, dog fancier, and descendant of Eli Whitney, the cotton gin guy. In 1934, her mother presented her with a four-legged gift, a magnificent white standard poodle named Champion Nunso Duke de la Terrace. Though born in Geneva, he'd been sold to England's Nunso Kennel, and he all but caninified the breed standard, a champion in Switzerland, France, Germany, and England. Duke was not for sale. Or he wasn't until Hayes Blake Hoyt's mother offered a thousand pounds, just north of 70000 of today's dollars. Though a born swimmer, the Duke could afford to cross the pond in style. Ms. Hayes Blake Hoyt, being a woman of means, the expense of building a kennel, even in the nadir of the Great Depression, was no biggie. The kennel she built was octagonal, its design meant to minimize the need for heating, not to save money so much as to avoid the drying effects of a heating system, which might impede the growth of good coats. Duke's move to Blackeen Kennel might be framed as a canine equivalent of selling Babe Ruth to the Yankees. Apologies to Boston for that. Refusing to hire handlers to show Duke, she donned her white gloves and led him into the ring herself. 
when a snowstorm kept most exhibitors away from a competition in Boston, Hayes Blake Hoyt donned snowshoes and broke a trail for her prize poodle from the kennel to the highway, getting to town in a train, and finally arriving just in time to get into the ring. Duke won Best in Show at Westminster in 1935, the start of the poodle's decades-long ascendancy in competitions and in popularity. In Duke's 18 U.S. showings, he was undefeated in the breed ring and only twice failed to win the group. Nine of his 16 group wins resulted in Best in Show. But the dog world hadn't seen nothing yet. Jungfrau, one of Duke's offspring, went on to be judged Best Standard Poodle 42 times and win 19... uh, What is it? uh, Best in Shows? Bests in Show? Uh, Ask your postmaster's general. Uh, Unlike her famous father, Jungfrau was the all-American champion, the mascot for the movement of American culture away from the influence of Europe. And the rise of the poodle in America came at the best possible time. From 1939, six years of war would leave Europe shredded, millions dead, cities and towns decimated, and millions more displaced. Rarely told is the story of dogs as collateral damage in war. Humans desperate to survive had no means of caring for their beloved dogs. Entire breeds were all but wiped out. America's Black Keen Kennel and Duke had preserved the poodle, and the beautiful people were all in. Poodles became a celebrity must-have. Gary Cooper, Grace Kelly, Katherine Hepburn, Elizabeth Taylor, Marilyn Monroe, all devoted poodle owners. Elvis Presley loved the breed and would give poodles as presents to girlfriends. High-end shops in the biggest cities would sell expensive poodle collars, clothes, and accessories, entrenching the breed's unfortunate she-she image. In 1960, and the 22 consecutive years that followed, the poodle, so down and out just three decades earlier, topped the list of AKC's most popular breeds. And of course, they come in three sizes, standard, miniature, and toy all measured by the same breed standard. Gun dog, comedian, status symbol, humans have molded and shaped the poodle for centuries. At the dawn of modern obedience training, the poodle was the go-to demonstration dog. Today, they're excellent guide dogs, assistance dogs for those with disabilities, and therapy dogs. So, who the heck is she? A quick spin through the archives newspaper clippings reveal she's very much the Swiss army knife of breeds. Poodles have helped enforce the law. According to police, a runaway miniature black poodle led two detectives on a chase to 50th Street and 1st Avenue where they spotted a man wanted for bookmaking. An arrest followed. They've been accomplices. Known as the French Poodle Gang, the three men were said to have used a two-year-old white miniature poodle named Dippy in their operation. Appearing to walk Dippy through quiet parking lots, they used a set of 64 master keys to systematically loot cars. And they've saved lives. The white poodle lunged between the snake and the boy, just as the rattler struck. Though struck six times, the dog was given anti-venom and will survive. Call the poodle the Meryl Streep of breeds, a multi-talented, people-loving, wicked smart canine that excels in almost any role she's given. Every now and then, a dedicated group of poodle fanciers seek to revive her reputation as a hunting companion, the very job she was bred for over the centuries. Uh, Good luck with that. Given the myriad of roles a poodle can master, it's hard to imagine how she'd find the time. Down and Back, stories from the AKC Archives. Visit akc.org for more on all things dog and find bonus materials for this episode. Follow AKC on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook at American Kennel Club. 
on Twitter at AKC Dog Lovers. And let us know what you thought of the show. And let us know what you thought of the show. If you're new around here, subscribe with your favorite podcast provider to catch up on this season and past episodes. Founded in 1884, the American Kennel Club is the recognized and trusted expert in breeds, health, and training. We advocate for responsible dog ownership and are dedicated to advancing dog sports. Research for Down and Back is provided by the AKC Library and Archives, the only national repository dedicated to the sport and enjoyment of the purebred dog. Learn more about the collections at akc.org slash library. <sighs> There's always a wise guy. Wow.